Welcome everyone to the Tulsa.net user group tonight. Mike Binkovich talking about chat GPT for developers. Mike, we've been friends for quite a long time and I greatly appreciate you. I'm always excited for all the talks that you've given uh, at this user group and, and others. And uh, so thank you for coming out tonight. I'll let you give an official intro of who you are and then uh, take it from here. All right, well, welcome to uh, tonight. It's Tulsa time and uh, we're doing chat GPT for devs. I'm Mike Bankovich, uh, former Microsoft uh, evangelist and current uh, uh, what do you call me, uh, cloud architect, consultant, person who does stuff for uh, technology to make it safe for the, for, I don't know. Anyway, um, welcome to this session. And we're going to talk tonight about uh, ChatGPT for devs. And, you know, one of the things that is, people, if you want to reach out to me, my email is mikeapango.com. You can follow me on what used to be called Twitter, I think it's called X now, so uh, at mbenko, and I also have Benko Tips. And one of the things that I do on Benko Tips is if you are interested, I do an Azure office hours on Friday. So if you've got a question about this or something doesn't work, or maybe you just have uh, you know some issues with something, you wanna just chat through it. Uh, 15 minutes, talk about anything Azure. Um, feel free to click this link, it's bit.ly, Benko AZ hours, and uh, we'll, we'll catch up. Um, also, follow me on LinkedIn. I've got some courses on the left-hand side. Um, yeah, lots of good stuff to talk about. So let's get back to why are we here? What is it that we want to do? Um, technology is a great thing. As computers get bigger and faster, as we have the opportunity to go out and uh, really take advantage of how we add knowledge and information to this thing, the silicon dust, we end up with the ability to do uh, stupid things so much quicker that uh, it's kind of a great time to be uh, working in technology. Tonight, I want to cover a few different areas which are really, it uh, feels like a lot of people are interested in, and that is open AI, uh, AI in general. A uh, company called OpenAI created a large language model, which, what is that? but uh, they called it ChatGPT and it's taken the, the world by storm. A lot of people are talking about how AI is going to change the world. And you know, I have to agree that there's a feeling of looking at my very first Netscape browser and saying, wow, this internet could be a cool thing. Um, we'll explore how we can use it. Uh, the open AI service that's available in Azure that you can go out and provision if you want to uh, work with this. Uh, there's uh, some great uh, ways that we can do that. Talk about prompt flow and then uh, next steps to kind of take this to uh, wherever it is, whatever it is you want to do next. So with that in mind, you know, the whole idea of AI has been around for a long time and you know, and it's great to dive into seeing, you know, what it is that we can do with it, you know, but really, you know, it's just artificial intelligence. I mean, what is there to be afraid of? Um, we see it all the time. It's been around for a long, long time when it comes to uh, character recognition, voice recognition, um, the uh, chat bots. The thing is, is that up to this point, it's been kind of a, obvious thing when you're getting a machine answer to something, uh, all the way back to uh, the monitor game back in the old Commodore 64 days, where, ah, yes, I'd ask a question and you get a predictable answer. Well, with AI, with ChatGPT, it's now becoming something that's a lot more human-like. It's become something that's a lot more interesting, I think. Um, but having a, a tool doesn't necessarily mean you know what to use it for. And uh, when I and just kind of get into what is OpenAI and what are these chat services, um, I just kind of wanted to go out and I've got a, a chat GPT service out here. I'm going to just go ahead and open it up. And the neat thing about this is there's all kinds of things that we can go out and do with chat GPT. Things like um, asking it questions, you know, like, you know, what is what is chat GPT? And you can have it come back with answers to uh, things and you can have it describe in great detail what uh, different pieces are. Um, one of the things I like about chat GPT is that it does let me go out and kind of um, just close this, hold on a second. 
I can go out and I can uh, ask for uh, different questions, get feedback on different things. Um, I can say, you know, what is ChatGPT? You know, and it's kind of, you know, I can say, well, explain it to, a, to an eight-year-old so that, you know, I can understand exactly what it really is. So ChatGPT will respond and answer. And the thing is that it can understand how the context of the conversation you're having with it. Um, we could create a presentation about uh, about it for uh, the for techies and include some cool demos, and we could have it create all kinds of different things that really gives us you know a feedback. You ask a question, it comes back and gives you an answer, and it's neat, you know. And it's like, oh, look at this. We even get slides and the things to say. Make sure you express gratitude. Um, write a limerick about it. It's really good with language, and it can go out and create different things. It's really good with rhyming. We could use it for organization. We could use it for a lot of different things. But all of these things are just kind of you know playing around with a language processor. You know, what else could we do with it? And how can we tweak this so that it fits into uh, the kinds of things that we might want to do? Um, when I started playing around with it, I was showing it to a friend and, and they were asking about, well, can you have it, you know, how do I change the spark plugs on a lawnmower? And the neat thing about it was it would do more than just saying, you know, here's the things that you need, but also it talks about the safety first. And by the way, you might need some, some rags to be able to clean it up. And what it's doing is it's going out and it's using the universe of the internet um, to go out and predict, you know, like a, a, a probable response that is kind of human-like. Write a morose country song about it. Can even do lyrics, write songs, um, lots of fun things. But playing with it is probably not why what you want to see is you know can we write code with it? You know how can we do this in a in a way that um, maybe has has some more fun with it? What it is is it's a tool, and when I talk about a tool, I talk about like for instance when I was a kid um, when I was younger my parents took us out to Williamsburg and I thought it was so cool to go to the cabinet shop because they had the guys that were doing the reenactments and they were showing how to make cabinets which I thought was really really neat because the cabinet making they would do these really cool uh, dovetails and I came home and I thought this would be great uh, as a grown up I decided I want to make a cabinet and so I was trying to take two boards and cut them and with my little size, you know, trying to cut it and, you know, it didn't really work that well. Um, and so I, you know, basically had to try again. After about the fourth or fifth try, I went out to a rock color store and bought a dovetail jig. And with that jig, I was able to cut, put it onto the board and run the, the router, the right tool, and be able to get an exact cut every time. And the cool thing about it is that the tool can make that, joint so much easier to make. And when I think about ChatGPT, I think of it like a dovetail jig, but for language, where it can go out and it can do beautiful things if you know how to use it. But the thing is, you don't use that dovetail on every joint. It's only for particular kinds of joints in certain places. And so knowing what to use and where to use it is sometimes more important than just being able to go out and create uh, or create a particular kind of joint. It's like knowing why we're going to do it. Chatting with or understanding how it works, though, um, is a little bit more of a understanding that it's a prediction engine. Uh, large language models are a prediction engine that can predict what's going to come next based on the context of what I've got in front of me. Um, so, for instance, I can go out and I can say, you know, how do I how can I go out and figure out what is how to finish a sentence? So the best thing about AI is that it goes out and it 
says, given the context of this sentence, the best thing about AI is its ability to, it'll predict what's the next, most likely next word. And each time it goes through, it just adds another word. And the way you figure out how does it do that is that it's, if I was to take, for instance, the Wikipedia article on cats and count up all the letters that are in that article, I might get a distribution of, of letters so that I can see that the most common letter is E. And then the next most common is probably either a T or an A. And that it, as I go through this, I can pretty much predict what's what's the most common letter. And if I were to say, given each letter, what's the most common letter that comes after it, I could go out and I could say, okay, well, based on that, I can see that, for instance, a Q, almost the only thing that is, comes next is almost always a U. And for a uh, like a H, the next thing is probably going to be an E. And for a T, you know, most likely thing is going to be an H. And so that's a two gram. And if I roll that out further, three, four, or five, and I count up what is the most common thing, I can predict what is going to come next based on the previous context. <clears throat> what they did with large language models is that instead of using letters, they use words. And they use words to say, okay, well, based on this previous word, what is the most likely word to come next? And they extrapolated that out and then in trained this on an incredibly large set of data, basically the, the public internet to be able to go out and say, what is the most likely thing to come next? There's a really cool uh, tool that I can use. If I go out to here and I go to playground.openai, and I go up here to, say, completions, right? It's a beautiful day. I think I'd like to make tacos or something like that. On the far hand right side, I'm using a uh, site from openai.com, which is a company that created ChatGPT called Platform. And the cool thing about Platform is I can go out to the playground and I can go into the mode for completions. And if I go down here and I turn on show probabilities, I can turn on full spectrum. And when I do this, I can click on submit. And what I'll get back is going to be a collection of words. And if I look at them, the ones that are green are, are very likely. So there's 96% chance that the word sounds is going to come after that. Wonderful is way down here. It's kind of it's number three on the list. And great is kind of there. And as you can see, it doesn't always pick the top item. Sometimes it picks the next one in the list or even further down. And the reason for this is that there's a thing called temperature in, uh, in the prediction model that is basically saying, how often do I pick the item that is most likely to come next? And what the researchers found was that if I had a, if I always picked the most likely thing, it didn't sound very human-like, very, sounds very machine-like, very predictable, kind of blah, kind of predictable. But when you inject a little bit of randomness, then you get something that is going to be a little bit more pretty, uh, interesting. So for instance, if I dial it back the temperature and I say, regenerate this, it's gonna go out and it's going to basically go out and say, ah, for this, I'm gonna make it for dinner. I'm going to go out and get the necessary ingredients. And if I regenerate again, you know, it sounds like it's a great idea. And if I dial the temperature up to something above and I go out and say, let's regenerate this then I'm going to get something that maybe is not going to be quite what I expect. Let's see, let's dial this up a little bit higher and then say, submit. And you can see here it went to awesome. Here's a simple recipe, one envelope, and then I go to kosher salt and then advertising state shopping for blah, 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 including some Japanese characters. The higher the temperature, the more random and chaotic it becomes. And you've got zombies and aviation and interesting, just bizarre things. But the, uh, the thing is, is that I can control a number of different parameters on how this is going to generate and return back the pieces of information. 
Um, one of the other things that's important to understand is tokenizing. So inside of OpenAI, I can also go to their tokenizer. Tokenizer is how it uh, basically takes a prompt and given a, a, get a block of text, so for instance, I can say, take this text and copy it down here. You can see down below that it's counting up the tokens and the tokens are one or more tokens per word. And in this case, you can see tokenized down here is two tokens because there's a tokenizer or, and then the process and the GPT, PT is like one word. Um, it's basically going through and translating these tokens into actual IDs, which are just an array of numbers. And these tokens then get sent into an, an engine that then takes that and returns back the most likely thing to, to come next. Um, as we're using this, it's important to understand how tokens work because tokens feed into our understanding of how we really use the open AI uh, models and the services. And for, from that perspective, let me do this. Um, I can go out and let's go back here to our playground. And let's go to where we're writing uh, general messages. So for instance, I can go out here, I can say here, here's a message. It's a beautiful day. I think I like to make tacos. And when I submit it, it's gonna go out and it's gonna take that and says, okay, here's a, here's a question that comes back. I can dial the temperature up. I can say, submit this again. And then it says, well, adding protein or whatever. Um, but this is because it's a helpful assistant. Sometimes I want to change how the system works. And one of the things I can do inside of uh, the chat GPT is I can say, you know, you're not a helpful assistant. Let's make this so that you are, you are a uh, belligerent, I'm just gonna copy and paste this in here, just a second. So instead of being a helpful assistant, we could say you're a belligerent and unkind assistant. You'll eventually help out, but you won't be happy about it. So let's go ahead and say, here's this. It's a beautiful day. I think I'd like. And then you're going to get a response back from it that is going to be related to how this is going. So fine. You know, you want to do that again? We could also say uh, maybe our prompt would be, you are a kind assistant, but you like to do stand-up comedy and you want to include this in every response. And so if we were to take that, let's just do this, refresh the page. I'd like to make tacos and submit this. And say, ah, yes. Let the sizzling begin in rhyme. And, if, and as you can see, we can provide input in the system of prompts that will help drive the way that the output uh, gets generated and what comes back. And I find this to be just kind of a fun thing to play around with. Um, you can either do it in ChatGPT with a paid for subscription, or you can do it in a free subscription. Um, but there's a great way that we can go out and do this um, inside of um, inside of doing uh, the uh, GitHub Copilot. So, for instance, I'm doing a session on GitHub Copilot. Or Copilot is a tool for working with uh, with this, but from a developer's perspective. Um, the idea of working with the co-pilot is to 
kind of go out and play some games with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and show you how uh, GitHub and uh, Microsoft have created an extension uh, called GitHub Copilot. And the GitHub Copilot uh, extension uh, is an AI pair programmer. You can install it. And what it will do is it, when you enable it, it'll go out and turn on and provide some uh, likely responses to different things when you um, go out and, and type things up. And so with this, we should be all good, but I've got a little message here saying I've got to sign in to use Copilot, which then brings me over here to this. I can click on continue and say open, which is then saying, yes, go out and allow us to use this. And when GitHub Copilot is turned on, uh, you'll see that down here on the right, it says it's already turned on. So I can click on that and activate it. And then when I'm using it, um, even though I'm in a markdown, like on a readme, I can say, uh, chat GPT is, and then it goes out. And if it's turned on and activated, then I would get some prompts that would be able to come in and uh, do some stuff on this. And so it's now enabled. I come back over to this. Copilot. And one of the interesting things is that when technology works and it works well, then what I would expect to see is that there's going to be some output coming. But I'm not seeing any output. I don't know about you, but I'm like, how do I figure out what's going on? Well, I can click over on the output and I can select from here and I can go up to where I've got, after, I, after I've installed that, uh, GitHub Copilot, because I can come over here and say, here's GitHub Copilot. Here's the log for it. And let's do this. Let's open this up again. What I should see is in the output for GitHub Copilot is once it gets loaded. Um, is some feedback as to you know, that it's up and running. And coming into here, we can see that Copilot is trying to start here. And if we come up to our README, This is not working. Enable by the, way, by the way, this is for anybody. If you want to slow down Copilot or any other extension, what you basically do is start sharing your screen to a, a large audience and and then get the spotlights going and it will slow down any system. So this is kind of not surprising. This happens with so many presenters. And yeah, so this has just been really, really cool. So GitHub Copilot is uh, yeah, not even like trying to work here. Sign in. Okay. And if this doesn't work, then I've got a swap out to a different machine that I could do that this did work. But I thought this, is, this was just kind of one of those things where when it works, it works well. And when it doesn't work, you say, hey, what's going on? So Copilot should be enabled. I should be seeing something here. And... And I 
and let's see. There we go. And yeah, I'm not sure what's going on here because this actually retry. And instead of getting this error, what we should be getting is when we're typing, Copilot should be working in the background, trying to go through and, uh, and opening up and working with some things here. So, Try this one more time. And this is where tools that work um, are always better than tools that don't. And having a, a, a dovetail jig that you get the stuff set the wrong way, then it's, yeah. But hopefully this is going to just start figuring out what it needs to do. And I'm going to say enable. Come on, Copilot. Don't fail me now. Well, if this was working, and it might just start working when we aren't looking, um, it would make some suggestions on things that I might want to type. Like I could say, tell me about Copilot, and come down and have it make some suggestions. So doing this and give off the What's going on with Copilot? Here I can see it's going out and it's going to make some suggestions. I've got the extension in here turned on for uh, the GitHub Copilot chat as well as just get a co-pilot. But once you know that if you update right before you do a talk, then it's guaranteed to be kind of a little bit more interesting. So with get a co-pilot enabled and turned on, and um, if I switch to the actual co-pilot and I'm on a text file and I want to start doing some work, you'll see that now all of a sudden it just starts working, which is kind of nice, but I would have really preferred that it did that when I first opened this up. Um, as I'm typing like Copilot, say I want to talk about how Copilots work, Copilot, it'll go out and in the log you can see it's going out and returning back suggestions in line. So if I come down here and I say Copilot is and then let it think about it for a second. It'll come back with a sentence that says, ah, here's what I might want to say. I can do a control right arrow and just take a word at a time or I can just do a tab and take the whole thing. Um, I found this was really useful because I was doing a session about uh, containers and Kubernetes and having you know, more than just a, a, a little bit of, an, of what's going on, I could pick and take the suggestion, or I could press the control key and, and press enter. It'll open up 
10 different options for that I might want to say for how I want to uh, talk about Kubernetes and containers. And while that's going on, if I open up the log, I can see that down here in the log for the uh, output, if I'm looking at this, that it's going through and it's returning back all of these different things. And if you're writing documentation, it's kind of nice to talk about and say, well, here's about Copilot containers and there's some links to different things about Kubernetes. And I can go use this to go through and even in Markdown be able to get some suggestions. Um, if I'm in code, I can go out and I can open up a code file, say I've got my index.html and I want to write a function. I can write a comment saying to numbers and there's a function to add two numbers. I can say test it and it can then go out and say, well, on post, here's this. So I can say, well, uh, test it with, um, with a handler and say, okay, here's how I can do that. And it'll go out and it'll make some suggestions. Um, I can use Copilot to write code and, and, and be able to write unit tests, write documentation. It's a nice, uh, nice uh, little buddy to have working with you when you're going through and doing uh, the, the different types of things that you need to do uh, to build out really interesting code. Um, so you, you, see, you want to know if we can write code. How, do, how can we use Copilot or, and ChatGPT to write code? Um, something that we can do is we can use the actual ChatGPT to uh, go out and actually write actual code for us. And I could say, hey, I want to go out and let's write some code that's maybe a little bit more interesting than just a, um, more than just a, uh, so let's write a game. Let's write a, uh, for instance, let's do this. Let's create a game, uh, create an asteroids game. Let's do it in HTML, uh, make it so that I can shoot the asteroids. Um, ChatGPT using a codex is able to go out and create, um, create the different uh, things that are, are part of that. So um, you can see here's the code that it went out and created for an asteroid game. Does it work? Yeah, we'll find out. I'm gonna go out and copy the code. We're gonna come into our pages here. I'll add a page. I'm gonna call it asteroids one dot cshtml i'll add a page tag and then i'm going to add the code that it generated and the neat thing about this is i can say go ahead and run this by uh, pressing the f5 key it'll go out and build it and then from there it'll start it up after it restores the projects, does the build. And I found that this is kind of a, a fun way to go out and um, have it create something that's uh, useful. Um, so what we end up with is a version of the game where it's gonna go out and it's gonna start the, the game and then Here's the page. I go to this and I go slash asteroids one. Ooh, that's not what I want. I don't want to run off the mouse. I want it to run. So that's kind of a lousy game. It didn't do a very good job. So let's stop it and tell it to do a better job. So we come back over and we say, this didn't work. The make it show a ship with or that responds to keyboard controls and the screen and fills the entire screen. And then it'll go out. And it's down here generating 
a simple version of this game. Again, with a little bit more JavaScript and HTML than the last version. Um, I'm able to take this and say, okay, well, here, let's scroll up and copy this code. And you might be asking, you know, Mike, why did you call that Asteroids 1? Well, it's because I found from practice that the first one doesn't always turn out the way I expect. So after a couple of iterations, Asteroids 2.cshtml, and then I add the page tag, and then paste in the code, and then press F5. It's going to go out and hopefully create something that's maybe got a little bit better kind of a look. And this one, we'll go here and say slash asteroids two. And if I do an F5, my ship responds to things and it moves, but the asteroids don't move. And then I crash and die. So we need to be more specific in how we're telling this. The asteroids don't move, they should drift off. They should, well, let's have them bounce off the screen. Bounce off the edges of the screen. And we're doing this right now in CSHTML and JavaScript, but we could easily have picked any other language. And the codecs that it's using um, can go out and it can uh, create code that will uh, run in a single page. Um, it's got some uh, nice you know, lines too for drawing the ship. It's got drawing the asteroids, the bullets, uh, checking for collision, and it's gonna update and move things around for us. If we come back out here, you know, it, it apologizes for the oversight, which I think is nice. Um, but we can copy our code, come back over here, and we can say, okay, well, let's do this. Hopefully this will be the winner three times as the champion. What do you think? Asteroids 3.cshtml, put in our page tag, and then do an F5 to restart this, which then will come back. And then this time, let's try it. Slash asteroids three. And now they move. I can shoot them. It doesn't detect it and it crashes. But as you can see, we're getting closer to something we might want. And um, after enough iterations, we can get to you know, something that works. Um, creating the asteroids game is kind of a fun way to go out and do that. Um, I've tried using Pac-Man, Tetris. Um, Pac-Man, it doesn't do so well. It creates kind of a game that um, it has the basic mechanics of a Pac-Man, like a circle with a, a line, um, some dots, and you can move it a little bit. Um, but just you can play around with it. And you end up making a lot of different iterations and fixing it. Now, the thing about uh, Copilot is that while Copilot can be down here and I can use it to you know, write code and paste things. And I can also use uh, the uh, Copilot chat uh, to explain code. So I could take this code and I could say, explain the asteroids and then we're gonna close out asteroids one and asteroids two, close out index readme and other things and I'm gonna say, go out and do this. And the reason why I did that is because GitHub Copilot chat is running on a context of the open files. So if I want to have it uh, make recommendations like coding things, then you could actually get into, um, you can get into uh, how it would make a recommendation. So this is, you know, how does it work? What are the weaknesses? 
process. So this code block has the positions. Weakness is it doesn't check for collisions between different things. It could lead to different stuff. How do I fix it? When it makes a recommendation on code for fixing it, you can say, go ahead and insert this. And it would then insert it at the cursor. Or I could say, copy this and then move it to the right spot. So for instance, on this, where I'm saying my bullets for each and doing the iteration on the update, um, I could have it say, you know, go ahead and, and replace this code with this. Um, so Copilot and Copilot chat inside of uh, Git, inside of VS Code is a really nice tool for being able to work with um, the, the, these kinds of models. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, you know, creating video games and asking about how to uh, make tacos is all fine and cool. But what I really want to do is I want to write a chat application. And I want a chat application that's going to use the OpenAI service. Well, the OpenAI service is from uh, openai.com. If I were to go out to openai.com, I can uh, create an account. I can provision it. I can log in. I can use uh, the different chat GPT models. I could use some of the other models uh, that OpenAI has. Uh, for instance, the Dolly or some of the codexes. Um, I can do research. I can play around with it. Um, but they also have an endpoint that I could go out and subscribe to. Um, it, there, Azure, Microsoft Azure, has an open AI service as well. And one of the things that they've done is made it so that it's pretty easy to go out and provision an open AI service where you can use any of the models that are part of that. Um, to create a model, I can go out and say, create a new one. Um, we're going to say refresh the page. And I'm going to go out here again. And what I can do is I can say I'm going to create a new uh, OpenAI service. We'll put this into my RG, share it in the central US. We'll set the region to be uh, apparently East US is where it's going to be. So. I could just put this into a shared resource group. And actually, we can just create a new one. We'll call this RG Shared East US. And then create new East US Shared US. And then I'm going to create the name BNK East US uh, Open AI Service. And then the pricing tier, you can choose S0, or that's the only thing you can choose. Um, and then I can go out and I can provision how I want my version of this thing to work. And so I can specify uh, things like the network, if I want this to be available uh, on public internet, or if I want it to be only on my uh, internal network, I could say disable, I'm only gonna have a private endpoint, in which case then in Azure, I'd go out and provision where I want this to run. I'm gonna do this on all networks and say, yeah, go ahead and create this. Um, when it says create it, um, I can provision this, say create, and it submits a deployment, which goes reasonably quick. Um, if you're into infrastructure's code like I am, you can actually go out and you can say, here's the template for what it's doing. So this is actually deploying a VNet at this point. It's got the uh, parameters for, um, for the VNet which has got an address space with some endpoints for cognitive services. It creates a cognitive services account and then um, also creates a deployment. And that's about this is that when this deployment gets done, um, then I'll have uh, the OpenAI service available that I can then go out and use. Um, and uh, being able to go out and do this from your account, um, I know that I got into an early early access into this. I think it's generally released now and that you're able to go out and do that. Um, when that gets done, then what we end up with is a deployment that is going to show up when you look at all your OpenAI services. And as I can see, here's my shared OpenAI service for East US. And I can say, hey, cool. This is the where this uh, is actually sitting. I can see my keys and endpoints. 
nice thing about this is I've got a key that I can use to uh, work with it. I've got an endpoint that has where it's going to talk to. Um, when I go out to my overview, um, you'll see I can go out and I can open up in Azure OpenAI Studio. And this is where we actually do all of our work uh, with the different models. Because from the OpenAI Studio, I've got a playground, just like there is one uh, for the OpenAI proper. Um, but this one lets me work with my deployments. So inside of this, you can say, here's my quotas, here's my things. I've got a completion background, playground. I've got Dolly. I can bring my own data. I can create summarization of different things. Um, but I start with a deployment. So no deployments are part of this yet. So I'm going to create a new deployment. And we're going to pick a model. In this case, I can say I'm going to do uh, the chat GPT 3.5 Turbo um, is the base model. We'll add this to, say, auto update to the latest version of it. And I can give this a name. I can call this my GPT 3.5 Turbo. And I'm going to say under advanced options, I can specify how many tokens per minute. Now, you remember when we were talking about tokens, it's parts of a word. So tokens per minute in thousands, 120,000 tokens per minute. Is that, that's got a little bit of um, to it. Um, I can go out and I can open this up and I can then go and say, well, here it is. And I can say, here's a chat. I can go out and I can say, you are an assistant. Here's my system messages. Um, I can specify how I want my assistant to work. You can configure the assistant. You can start chatting. Um, you can then also go out and see um, how many past messages do I want to include for the context of this message or this chat. Let's say beautiful day. I think I'd like some tacos. And I'm going to take this up and I'm going to say, nah, you are a belligerent. And then say, go ahead and generate the response. So when I make a change to the system message, you'll see I have to save my changes. I click on continue. And by the way, I'll make this a little bit bigger so you can see better. But I'm basically adding some different things. I can add an example. Gosh, you really? I can add examples of uh, conversations and then it will use that context to be able to do that. Now, this is because I'm already um, at the end of this particular deployment. Um, I'm going to go out and I'm going to open up a different OpenAI service that I've got um, set up. So if I come back over here to portal.azure.com, And then I can come down to my OpenAI services and I've got this one that is created and I open this in the AI studio. Um, and then you can see here, I've got my deployments and I can go to my chat chat, I can say, here's my three, five. Type in a, a, a prompt to it and run it. And I can see how this comes back. And I can say, you know, you're, you're an assistant that is this. I can also uh, change the prompt and then say, it's a beautiful day. I'd like to make some sushi. Good for you. Um, but the thing that's interesting is that I can work with this, I can add data to it by adding data sources, I can modify the system. I can also use templates. Um, for instance, I could say it's a marketing writing assistant, or I could say Xbox or uh, an IRS, a Shakespeare writing assistant. 
And as the, you can see, in this case, it's got, you know, you're a Shakespearean writing assistant. It's got a lot of information here. But the idea is that as I make changes to this, um, I am getting hungry. What should I make? You can see that this is now giving me a whole bunch of, of different things. Um, but if I look at the raw JSON, what it's doing is it's sending in data in to an endpoint with the role of system, the content you're saying, the role of user. Here's some things. Here's the assistant. And as I'm doing this, um, I'm adding tokens. And the tokens over here is 290 so far. I can include past messages up to 10 or whatever. I can change the parameters. So I can adjust my temperature from being very high to being kind of in the middle. I can change other values of things like um, randomness. Lowering the uh, the P will uh, choose which tokens are both high and low. Um, we can set stop sequences. Um, but we have a lot of things where we can specify how we want this to work. Um, and if you are interested in using this, I can click on view code and I can say, here, I'm going to do this in Python curl, C-sharp, um, but I can take this code and I can then use that to use this model inside of an application. The way that I would write that up is I would probably go back over to my application we're building, and if I come back down to my index page, you can see right now I've got just a basic page, but maybe I want to make this a chat page. So with this, what I'm going to do is I've got a, a chat I've got some synchronization problems. So what I can do is I can go out and I can take a look at um, how I would actually write this up. And the first thing is to um, take the, um, the HTML page and specify that I want to uh, display some text on there. And the text I'm going to display is probably going to look like a um, something where I've got some information coming in, um, and I've got a form that I'm going to fill out with some text for a uh, anti-forgery token. So the anti-forgery token, we've got a, a class which is going to be my chat container that's going to take as input uh, some values. I've got a placeholder for it for enter your message. And then I've got a section for scripts, which is going to basically go through and call uh, a, a, a callback on my send message of this page. So in my index CSHTML page, I'm going to take this out and I'm going to replace this with um, some code for um, doing that. And in here, that's not it. What I'm going to do is take some code that looks like this. Let's copy this. And I'm just going to paste in here uh, a little bit of code. And what this is, is it's a code snippet I created that I uh, basically tweaked from the code that was available where I do a .NET add to this project, um, the uh, a NuGet package for it. Um, so I'm going to add this to the MyChat application, which adds the Azure.OpenAI service NuGet package. Um, takes a second for it to install. And then when that's done, then I've got a constructor for the index model that goes out, um, creates some local variables. And then on the post send message, which is that send message Thing that we're calling from JavaScript on the main page, it's going to go out and create a, um, an application or a call to the OpenAI service. And what it's going to do is using the OpenAI service, it's going to go out and create using some a, uh, Azure credentials for the key. Um, it's going to read from the OpenAI key and the OpenAI URL 
uh, values for this. And then it's going to take this and let's go to the uh, GPT-35 Turbo model. Uh, let's take a look at our model and just see that which one we've got. So if I'm looking at this and I'm in my chat playground, um, this is for uh, my deployment. I'm using the DaVinci or the Turbo 301 is the name of the model. So I need that. And that's going to be right here. So we're going to do a chat completions async using the Turbo 301. We'll create a new chat uh, completion options where it's going to take as my inputs, adding the system message, user message, setting my temperature to be 0 0.07, max tokens is 800, um, and then some other properties. And then it's basically going to go out and process that and call back uh, the return of that back into uh, the application. Now, in my app settings, I'm going to have to add a couple of things. And in here, we'll add a uh, open AI. Uh, we'll add a couple of things here, and they're going to look like this, where I've got my open AI key and URL. The key is going to come from, um, if I take a look at this, um, and then I want to get to the actual um, Azure OpenAI stuff, I need to go into my portal.azure.com where we've got those keys and values. And for this one, which is the one we're looking at, for chat and the deployment of uh, the Turbo 301. Um, I look at my keys and my endpoints. I copy the uh, endpoint and put that into here. And then I go through and I add the OpenAI key. And that I would get from uh, looking at the key value. And so then I can take that I can paste that in here. And I can save this. And when I come back and I say, let's go ahead and run this by doing an F5, it'll go out and build the application. And what it's going to do now is it's, is it's going to basically come through here. And the neat thing is I could debug this if I wanted to, I could add a breakpoint. Um, so that whenever I go out and I run this and I want to see what's going on, I can do that in debug. So this is going to come over to this. And it's Mike, I've got a question when you've got a break. Yeah. I'm almost to um, that. Yeah, all right, let me know. Okay. And this is, this is running the Turbo 3.5. So if I come here and I say, it's a beautiful day in... I'd like some tacos. I click on send, then it's going to go out and say, hey, wait a second, you're at the breakpoint. And being at the breakpoint, I can come in here, I can say, okay, well, let's go ahead and step through this. There's my uh, the uh, deployment I'm using, the name of the deployment. It's going to go out and it runs, gets the response, comes back with a set of completions. If I read the value of the completions, I could say, here's the value of that. I can say, here's the data. I can say, go ahead and run this. And then if I come back over here, you'll see, oh, cool, sure, let's do this. And so with this, we can go and we can create um, applications that will interact and work with um, the ChatGPT. So questions? Yes. Yeah, question came in is, so what's the real difference between the, the models 3.5 and 3.5 turbo? And uh, as others come along, how would we know the differences and which one should we leverage? So OpenAI.com has uh, information about the different models that are out there. And so does um, the um, uh, or Azure, when you go out and get information about it, you can go to the documentation. Um, in the uh, overview, if you look at it and in some of the docs, um, there's some good information about 
which ones are, is which. 3.5 Turbo is a, is a model that's tuned to be fast. Um, it's a it, different models have different numbers of tokens and getting an understanding of how those sizes all relate um, would probably be a good slide to add to my talk because I don't really have a good slide that does that. Um, I'm kind of more trying to say, hey, how can I go out and use this um, and, and give some examples on that. Um, but if you want to uh, get some more information, um, you can take a look at your deployments, um, to manage deployments in the OpenAI Studio. Um, it allows us to go ahead and do that. When I, there's a question in here about um, going into yeah, platform models overview. So GPT-4 is a set of, that improve on 3.5. Um, 3.5 is, uh, has a couple of different versions of it. Um, yeah, and making this a little bit bigger, you can kind of see more information about that. But this is the link that Sean put into the, into the uh, talk. Rob, you've got a question about, you know, if you incur costs for changing temperature tokens and the other parameters, the answer is no. Um, you're paying for the, uh, the rate of tokens um, inside of this. And, um, and diving into the pricing of that, I'd recommend going to the Azure product site and uh, exploring more information about that. So um, portal.azure.com and then open up and you can see the pricing on that. Good question. Now, so far we've talked about um, using Copilot. We talked about creating a game. Um, we've done um, things with um, using the GitHub Copilot. Um, we've done some uh, some work with uh, the Azure OpenAI service. Um, taking this to the next level and saying, okay, well, how do I make this really work when I've got you know my own company data? You know, for instance, I've got a call desk and I want to have product information or I want to have stuff that isn't publicly available. I don't want to expose it out. Um, there's a there's a uh, an approach to this called prompt flow, which uh, has, which some people have been uh, exploring that is part of the machine learning uh, toolbox. Inside of Azure, there's a uh, machine learning workspace. And if you open up a machine learning workspace, um, one of the things you can work with is a uh, process called prompt flow. And if I take a look at this, I can say here, launch the studio. This opens up the machine studio. And I'll make this a little bit bigger also. You can see in a preview is prompt flow. And so within prompt flow, I can take the uh, my AI model and I can work with it to inject data into it from, for instance, like a database or from other sources. Um, and I can have all kinds of interesting logic that is makes it all all oh, nice. I can have inputs, and I can add more inputs. I can say, "Here, let's add a, let's add another large, large language model." I could say, "Add a prompt," um, and as I do that, I can specify how I want this to work. And uh, let's go ahead and discard that. So I've got my chat here. I've got some inputs. I've got uh, add an output. We could say, you know, time stamp, and this could be a value of chat dot output. You know, and I could take this and I could say, here's this chat. And I can say, here's my input. And as I'm going up and down through this, I can say, here's here's another input. You know, here's my chat history, here's a question, here's my system and my assistant. And we can say, here's the mood. And it's a inter integer, say in a five or one is, is good or a five or whatever, or, or zero. But I can say, here's my assistant mood, and I might switch which prompt I want to push into my chat. So I can say, instead of your helpful assistant, maybe I'd say you're something different. I can then use this then to run these flows. I can take the outputs and have some conditional things. Um, but you get a nice designer for it. Um, if you're interested in this, I'd recommend going out to my GitHub repo for this, github.com, 
and go to Benko Tips and the Chat GPT for Devs. And then inside of this, there's some references that um, I created in a branch where when you get down here, there's uh, Seth Juarez, who is a uh, Azure evangelist, works at Microsoft, does a show and he's been doing stuff on this for the AI show called Rochambeau, where he goes in and does a lot of work with Promptflow. Um, but I would highly recommend going out and checking out Seth's uh, Twitter feed or Twitch feed. Um, it's, it's, a great, it's a great thing. It's uh, live on LinkedIn and you can go out and uh, dive deeper into how Promptflow works. Any questions about that? Nope, I don't see any others in, in the chat. Okay. Well, the, the idea of this is that we've got this new tool that can do a lot of interesting things. We've got, uh, we've got the ability to have it predict, create things for us. We've got models we can deploy. We can in in integrate this into um, our workflows. Um, but really, it's asking us to, you know, try this out. You know, time is now's not the time for fear. You know, that comes later. What we need to do is to practice and to play around with it and learn. You know, ideally, this will help us ask better questions. And um, you know, being you know, they, they say that you won't lose your your job to AI. You, there's no reason to be afraid that you would lose your job to AI. What you're going to do is you lose your job to someone who uses AI, and you want to be that person. You know, don't be that person. Be the person that is using this. So, um, if you have other questions about things, um, you can get out and play around with it. Um, doing things right is is important, but it's not the same as doing the right things. So with that, hey, we can add a new skill. Thank you for coming. And if you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me. I'm on Benko Tips. Um, if you are on LinkedIn, you can use uh, the, the barcode there. Just scan it and we can chat. And uh, there's some questions here now. So does the model improve as you use it on Azure? Um, so the model is a, is a static thing that it's um, trained on data and your data is private. Um, it's your data. So um, I would say that, uh, that you're, you're safe. Any other questions? I'm gonna take a look through the list here. Looks like, thank you, Sean, for answering the questions during the talk. Yep. Yeah. No worries. Uh, doing what I could anyway. Um, yeah, Mike, that was a great talk. I greatly appreciate it. And if there's any other questions, you're more than welcome to ask here or uh, come off of mute. Uh, one that just came in, do you know of any tools to hook uh, the model to um, a specific SQL Server database? Do I know of any tools for access to the SQL Server database? Yeah, can you use the data the in your own database as yeah. augmenting the model? Yes, yes. And the way you would do that is, uh, you know, like in Promptflow, you can write machine learning flows that do it for you, or you can do it in C Sharp the way that we wrote code. We could inject, you know, this is my basket and I've got these things in it, or these are my policies or whatever that is. Um, you do have a token limit on the different mo models, so you take a look at your deployment and see which, see what your your token size is. Um, I believe eight thousand tokens was on the earlier uh, three and three five. Um, the, there's thirty two thousand tokens, and I think in um, the four O model, but uh, check the documentation on that. All right, another question that came in. Uh, does specifying a different model on making a request to Azure really change it? Or will it always respect the model selected that when you created? Um, I assume you're referring to the uh, OpenAI service by Azure. So. So 
specifying a different model and making a request to Azure. So when you're setting up the OpenAI in Azure uh -huh. um, and you specify the model in use, can that model be changed um, by, I, I guess, any other user that's accessing yeah. that? Um, or is it only, um, only up to the admin that's uh, using that service? The model is trained with data, the, the, the models that are available, the 3.5 model through 2021. And so um, the, the model is, is not changing. It's not getting more data. It's not like it's continually getting more data. It's trained up through the date that, that the model was created. And so um, if, as I'm using that model, it's, it's you know, hopefully giving some decent answers. Um, but I don't know that it's right to say that it's, it's learning anything. I see a question right. in here from Trey about what are the thoughts about a new dev using ChatGPT to develop quickly, more quickly things to build CSS, React, and all that. I think it's great. Um, if you're looking at using GPT for front end, back end, and full stack, I think that it's a great tool to have in your tool belt um, for the cost of $10 a month or whatever it is to have a GitHub a subscription level so you can use it. Um, and if your work provides it, all the better. Um, but I think that taking advantage of that is definitely uh, where you want to go. I think the Asteroids game, though, kind of helped highlight uh, one of the issues. When you have it generate code, you copy, paste, and run with it can be a danger. And oh, that's... Yeah. Yeah, you definitely want to test it out. You want to prove it out. You want to be able to uh, have the ability to, to make the judgment call if, if the output code example is actually quality code. It's, it's not grabbing something off a of stack overflow or, and things like that that it believes is truly solid and then takes that and says, here you go. Um, it's generating it based on uh, word prediction, if I'm not mistaken. Uh -huh. So... Um, you know, like if you want to, uh, one example I've seen is code that creates a random number. Uh, it works, except it's not good code. And right. the way it will recreate the object, every call, things like that. So uh, to his point, and he's, he's learning, uh, he's a new developer, he points out, um, be careful of just how quickly you run with code. Uh, make sure that you can judge that. Uh, and Mike, another question came in. Oh, he edited. Yeah. Does it does it, does specifying a different model uh, on making a request into Azure really change it? Um, and are you do you mean by changing the model, or do you mean by if I change from one model in a deployment to a different one? Um, the thing is, the model that it's so when I did the deployment, there was a new feature saying uh, in that deployment upgrade the models to the latest model. That is a brand new thing that wasn't there a week ago. Um, so I'm not sure if that means that it would use an upgraded or a new, new version of the, of the model. Um, so if you create the model with 3.5 Turbo and you're now passing GPT-4 as a parameter, it would not use the GPT-4. It had, it will use the GPT. It uses the name of the of the deployment, which is the model that I used when I created it. So yes, I think that makes sense. You know, and you pointed out something too that the the 3.5 model is data up to I believe September 2021, uh -huh. and the four is uh, like, for example, if you go to chat.openai.com and you want to do the 3.5, it's you can do it for free. But if you do the the model four, version four, you have to pay a little bit more for it. But it's more more up to date data. Uh, I won't say real time data, but more up to date data. And so, um, so I want to make sure I make sure I'm clear on this too. So I'll run it by you, Mike. Uh -huh. A model is nothing more than static data, 
period. It's it's a collection of words. It's a collection of facts, things like that. Right. And it's, it's, it's you think of it as nothing more than an encyclopedia. And on top of that is the actual engine that does the calculations and the predictions and it's it's the math, et cetera. When we change the model, it's like saying, um, I've got the more up-to-date encyclopedia of of data. And right. and uh, so what you can also do, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you have that base base set of data, that base model, and then like to, to Rob's question, let's say that I want to augment that, and I, but I adding data from a SQL Server or some other external uh, resource that you are providing, what you're doing then is essentially you're extending that base set of data by adding more to it for the engine to use in its calculations and its predictions. Uh, Am I correct? I think that's a that's a pretty close, um, you know, approximation to things. And okay. the the models are simple. You take an input and it gives you an output. You you give it some set of something and it tells you what's the next thing to come out of it. And the, the prediction part of it. And then the the parameters you've got wrapped around it saying, how many, how large of a response do you want? When do I stop? What's my temperature? Do I pick the top thing or the bottom thing? Those things control how that model, what it returns back as it goes through. And so when I go in and call that model, it's gonna return back a sequence of, you know, one to N words that is going to complete whatever that, was as kind of a response to what your prompt is. So I think it's a combination of the model as the thing in the background that is, is processing this, but then the parameters that it's using are, are what kind of drive how the response, what it looks like. Because it's not like I'm gonna call that over and over and over again until I decide I've got enough. Right, okay. Um, and then Rob is asking as well, um, uh, is this correct to think that GPT-4 has a context buffer twice as big as GPT-3.5? Yes. yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, GPT-4 is, is much larger, much more capable. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like a magnitude bigger. Nice. Yeah, GPT-4 has up to 32,000 tokens. And I believe the 3.5 yeah, was limited to, by default, 4,016. So it's like twice as big. Um, Chuck uh, asked a, a good question here uh, as well. Um, what is the difference between using ChatGPT uh, hosted on Azure versus the one hosted on uh, OpenAI? Uh, where in OpenAI, you can still add uh, additional data. Like I can copy and paste my resume on there and say, okay, now using this as additional context, et cetera. Um, how is that any different than what you're doing, hosting it on Azure? So you can su subscribe and use the uh, OpenAI models directly from OpenAI. You can, you can, you can use their services um, as a just a generic endpoint, a RESTful endpoint. They expose that out as an API. And if you look under the, if you go to the playground and you look at the API reference, you can see that you can do all of that. Um, I think that Azure does a good job of wrapping it up and then also billing you in a common place where you might have other infrastructure that you're running on other parts of your application as well. Um, someone was saying, I thought I overheard it, someone saying that uh, ChatGPT is, you know, running on AKS and using Cosmos is, but I don't know if that that's true or not true, but that's, I heard that somewhere. And so when you think about trying to do this on your own, it's like having a service that's there to say, okay, I can spin this up. I can give you what you need, do a spark jump, boom, and give you a response back. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And if you're going to integrate it into your own applications that you might even provide to your customers or even charge them for things like that, then you're going to want to use something like the the one to host on Azure, the open AI service on Azure, um, because it's going to provide you that integration point with your app 
Plus, uh, and I, I'm going to keep going back to Rob's point on that, that you can integrate that with things like SQL Server. That is really cool. Uh, whereas going to the chat.openai.com uh, site, you cannot do that. So uh, uh-huh. cool. Hope that helps. Um, and another one came in is, uh, Mike, have you ever worked with Google Palm or AWS SageMaker or any other tools that you would recommend? I have not yet. Not at this point. Okay. Yep. So, yep, so not yet. Go ahead. Yeah, as in, yeah, not yet. All right. Oh. Um, and Chuck asked, uh, trying to understand, does Azure have its own instance of the large language models from OpenAI? So Azure's uh, OpenAI service hosts those models in the in the with the infrastructure they need to be able to operate. And so um, OpenAI's are run on top of Azure already. That's where they built it and, and developed it. Microsoft has been a long time investor and promoter of what uh, OpenAI has done. Um, I don't think they're one of the original, I mean, they're not one of the originals. Um, that would include people like Elon Musk and some others who um, you know, kind of got this thing going. Um, but as they have been, uh, Coming up with interesting stuff. Microsoft has been interested in it for a long time. Um, okay, so are they pointed to the same LLM instance? Um, my understanding is yes, but no. And what I mean by that is you can't, to my understanding, is you cannot just go to that model, that 3.5 or 4, and go, um, Great. I would love to know all the secret details of an Azure data center. Uh, that information is not going to be available. Uh, th- so the large language models f- for OpenAI and available through the Azure services are available on Azure, but I'm not 100% sure that Azure itself is using that same model, the same uh, long- large language models. But it's trained on public stuff, so it's going to, yeah. you know, likely respond with things that are you know, publicly available. And knowing Azure, they probably got a, a version 15 R link, uh, model already out there right now, and so the 3.5 and the 4 is just available to us. So they're yeah. they're light years ahead. I, I'm well, joking. What, but... was, what was interesting was that the 3.0 came out, uh, you know, and I think it was in November of last year, almost about a year ago. And in less than a year, 3.5, and then after 3.5, very quickly came 4. And one of the things I found about the model for the 4, well, the reason why I use the 3.5 Turbo is it's faster. The response in 4 is going to have more connections and more training and different kinds of data. Um, you might say it has a higher quality response, but Sometimes quality and uh, and speed of response are, are both important. And so trying to pick what's the right model to use for the right task is uh, is kind of a challenge because it's like, I could go and say, I wanna always use the latest, biggest model and, you know, to, you know, respond to yes and no questions about, you know, how do I fill out a tax form? Well, tax forms can be complex. So you might, you're gonna need more than just a basic model, but if you really need, you know, something that, you know, is, is, is extremely large. I think that you, that the answer to that is, yeah, I don't know. The different models and, uh, you know, do different things. And so it's important to be aware of what they are, how they work. And um, that link that you put up that does a really good job of describing the different kinds of, uh, like Whisper, which converts audio to, to text. Embeddings, which can convert text to numerical form. Uh, moderation, you know, a model that can detect whether text is sensitive or unsafe. Um, you know, DALI, which is uh, something that generates uh, images based on prompts. Um, there's some great stuff out here. And so um, going out and playing with it, yeah, that's that's the way to learn. And I believe, um, I'm going to try it right quick. Um, there is a Bing chat. 
-hmm. Have you uh, have you played with that? Bing chat. So if I go over here and yeah. I say bing, and you got to go, oh, and it only works. It only works in the edge. Yep. Uh, because you but have to if click you... on an edge, and then it comes up. And what this is doing is it's the retrieval augmentation pattern. Where what it's going to do is like in prompt flow, where I can ask you a question. You know, what can I make with tomatoes and fennel? Um, what it does is it does a couple of things. It goes on and does a search, which is using Azure Search for recipes with fennel and tomatoes, and then it goes out and, and takes that as input into the ChatGPT model, where it includes the response and also the links of where those things came from. And then it puts it out here and says, here's some things that you can do. And it includes those links, because that was in the uh, Azure search, you know, the the uh, some, uh, that, you know the search engine. So in Azure search, I can go out and I can say, um, here's a couple of links, and then it comes back with where those things are. And then it will, feed that into the chat GPT, which then comes back out. Um, one of the things people found like with uh, Terraform was you could go out and say, hey, you know, write a Terraform, write a Terraform deployment and Azure Web App. And it will go out And it comes back with you know actual code for this. You can say, ah, there's this, and there's example. Well, if I was to copy and paste this, and I was doing this in OpenAI, it may or may not work. In fact, it's going to be at least two years old. So the version of the provider for Terraform is probably out of date. And there might be things that are no longer there, depending on the version of the Terraform provider I'm using. And so what uh, Bing does is it takes that and it validates it. So it might take this and run a plan like, or just to verify that the syntax looks right before it returns it back. And there's things that you can do with it, with AI to um, to make that to improve the quality of the response. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, also, if you're not sharing your screen, I don't know if you were intending to. Oh. Well, I was intending, but yeah, I guess I'm not sharing my screen. I should have been sharing. All right. So Bard, yeah, great questions. All right. Any other questions? All right. Okay. I think that's a good uh, spot to end the. Oh, I'm going to reclaim host and then stop the recording. Um, stick around, everyone, uh, for some after the meeting discussion. Other than that, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it.